Now, before I really begin, I want to thank you, Betty, for um, the introduction. <coughs> uh, I can't remember saying, why did you latch on to me? <laughs> <laughs> and um, <coughs> um, you mentioned uh, Solskjaer and one of the wonderful things that he said was, if a nation, if a people, if an individual forget their heritage, they're losing part of their soul. And that's, to me, an extremely important um, observation. <clears throat> In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. I have come this morning from celebrating the heartbeat of the Church's life, the Holy Eucharist, the Mass. And it's in that great celebration at the altar of God that the whole life of Christ Jesus the Lord is brought before us. His incarnation, which I shall be talking about more fully, and his life, his teaching, his very being, his institution of the Eucharist, the night before he died, his journey along the way of Calvary to the cross, the commitment that he made uh, to the blessed John the Apostle to look after his mother and his command to his mother to look after his son, uh, John as a son. And then his resurrection. But remember, he proclaimed the victory on the cross. That's where the victory was proclaimed. The resurrection was necessary for us, was not necessary for him because he was not bound by the limitations that we know. And that victory became apparent not so much in the empty tomb, there's a fair bit talked about the empty tomb, the grave clothes that are lying there with, without a body. But the wonder, in my opinion, and in the church, church's teaching actually, of the resurrection was the changed lives of the apostles. They emerged eventually and gradually, slowly realising the power of the divine presence within them, which gave them the courage to face the world and all its complexities and stupidities and to teach the Christ and to live the Christ. And I'm always drawn, I said a minute ago, that Jesus instituted the Eucharist to celebrate his life and to give us food for the journey in the Holy Communion. He celebrated that the night before he died in the upper room. 
it was far more than just a supper. It was the bringing of his whole life in a concentrated presence. And when he said, when he took the bread and, and the cup of wine and said, this is my body, this is my blood, he did not say, this represents my body or this represents my blood. He said, this is. In other words, his true and real presence came among us in a special way at the celebration of the Eucharist. And not only did it institute the Eucharist, but he celebrated the first Eucharist on earth at, at Emmaus. You remember on Easter night, two of the disciples were walking down about 20 furlongs from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And they were confused at what had happened, totally confused. And this stranger appeared whom they didn't recognize. And he said to them, what are you talking about? And uh, he said to them, why are you so perplexed? And then he unraveled to them the coming of himself, that much of the Old Testament scriptures has been pointing to. And the story goes, as it is recorded in the Gospels, their hearts were burning within them because they had been brought up as faithful Jews and they hadn't recognised where the prophets were pointing to the coming of the Messiah in Christ. And anyway, they arrived at Emmaus and with all the teaching that they had, they were blind. And then, when they insisted that he stay with them, of course it was all divinely planned, no doubt. And in the midst of the meal he took the bread and blessed and consecrated it. They recognised him then. And that was the first Eucharist that was celebrated and so it's gone on ever since. Now, Many of the fathers of the church, and I include myself in that uh, to a uh, limited degree, see the Eucharist as the heartbeat of the church's life on earth. And it stems from our Lord's own action. Now, I have here what we call a mitre. The bishops wear them. It reminds us of the tongues of fire that descended upon the apostles on the Feast of Pentecost when Jesus promised them the gift of the Spirit. And it was then that those 12 men were made apostles. And it was on them that he founded the church. And the mitre is worn by bishops because they 
uh, in the apostolic succession and linked directly back to the apostles. And the mitre represents the tongue of fire that came and sat upon each of them. It's interesting, this was made for me by a priest, the Greek letter for Jesus Christ, the fish, the sign, the first sign very early on to uh, remind people they were Christian and when during those Roman persecutions the Christians would mark the sign of a fish on the ground and someone if they were a Christian uh, they would recognize the other person and that an early symbol of the Holy Mother of Jesus. The rose, another symbol of the Holy Mother, are the seven gifts of the Spirit and the seven fruits of the Spirit. The cross with Jesus upon it and the skull the dove representing the descent of the Holy Spirit the angels representing heaven and the communion of saints the Holy Mother and down here a reminder that the Christian life is demanding and it's not easy to live it often at times. I'd, this is the Russian Orthodox cross. I chose it when I became a bishop because when I was a fairly young priest 50 years ago the bishop where I served in Wangaratta Diocese in Victoria, he went and stayed with the Patriarch of Moscow. And there were two vivid things that he told us when he came back uh, from being with the Patriarch. First of all, he was taken out to breakfast and as he sat with the Patriarch two Russian Orthodox monks came in, made the sign of the cross and sat down and to have their breakfast. And this bishop of mine said to the Patriarch, does that always happen? And the Patriarch said, yes, right through the communist era. They were unafraid. And the, the next thing that the Patriarch told uh, my bishop was it was the grandmothers that kept the faith alive in their grandchildren when the communist atheistic regime was flourishing and I it hit me very forcibly so that's why I wear the Russian Orthodox cross as my bishop's pectoral cross because it reminds it reminds me of the faith of people despite their surroundings and the likelihood of losing their lives and it reminds me of the faithfulness 
of those who pass on the faith. Now, we're living in, I guess, no more dangerous times than when I was born 85 years ago and when I became a priest 60 years ago and when I was consecrated a bishop 33 years ago. These times are not that much different. However, as you well know, the whole spiritual inner vitality and wholeness of people is being lost because not only are so many children have no concept of the wholeness of life, the inner spiritual drive, they have no concept of it. But sadly, many of their parents haven't either. They've got They've steered away. They don't see it as of any relevance. But that inner faith is what not only matures our life, but it also disciplines it. You imagine if there were no traffic rules, it's bad enough when hoons get on the road and misbehave and think they're immortal. But if there were no traffic rules, no traffic lights, no driving on the right side of the road, the correct side of the road, <coughs> there would be chaos far more than there is now. Now, our life is a disciplined life. Our very bodies operate like that and when they don't f function correctly we know the consequences. Where does this, where does this really deposit our understanding? In my opinion, and in the teaching of the Church's opinion, it goes back to the Incarnation. There would have been no victory from the cross. And our Lord would not have been able to accept the Father's will in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he died, unless he had been truly God and truly man. The Church proclaims it in its creeds, in its formulas, in its teaching. But it's, the, it's God becoming man in our human nature that is the centre of the Church's life. And on that, everything else hinges. Now, it's true that the, there is a divine presence in creation all around us. In the animals, I have no doubt about that. God is present in the way that he has chosen in the whole of creation in our own lives, in the various ways that he cho chooses to bring us that presence, to make us alive to that presence, but in a very, very special way and unique way. He chose the Holy Mother Mary of Nazareth to bear his son in the world 
and those wonderful words of the creed and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man and lived among us. And so the divine took our human nature into himself and placed his divine nature specially in Jesus, his son. And the incarnation, the coming of Jesus as God and man enshrines and lifts our human nature out of itself, as it were, and gives us the divine imprimatur, makes us not just mere uh, materialistic beings, but a human being that has been impregnated with the divine presence and there can't be a true wholeness of life, a true well-being unless one accepts that spirit of God that is within us. You know, I've been listening over Radio National over the past month or so and there have been a number of commentators about science and the scientists and more and more of the scientists now are recognising that there is a limit beyond which they can't go with their scientific experiments. Why? Because they are recognising more and more the, the mystery and wonder of something beyond themselves. And my friends, that's what the Christian faith and the authentic churches celebrate when they gather at the altar of God around the Eucharist, there is Jesus in his incarnation, his life, teaching, death and resurrection, concentrated for us to breathe in the wonder of God. One of the prayers uh, that I use when I've been confirming people into the faith is to fill the candidates, Heavenly Father, with a love of your holy name, with the truth and justice that you give and encourage in mankind, and fill them with wonder and awe in your presence. We've lost that to a great extent. And yet, it's the wonder and awe, the mystery of life beyond what we call life that brings us into focus and makes us see that Jesus is alive amongst us through and by his incarnation so that our human nature is beyond itself a presence of God in the world. Don't underestimate the mystery and wonder of God. Don't underestimate the inner reality that faith brings ever before us. Don't ask me to explain what faith is. 
because I don't know. It's a mystery that I hope and believe I shall discover when I reach heaven. But it's real. And the more real it becomes in our lives, the stronger and the more wholesome is our well-being as we journey through life. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, you created your Son, born of a human mother, so that he might not only share our human nature, but also bring our human nature into union with yourself. We praise and magnify your holy name. Amen. You want to fire some shots at me? <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's most uh, unusual to have the opportunity to follow uh, a homily like that uh, with questions. <laughs> so I'm delighted at the very idea because <laughs> so often, you know, it, it's it's so good to say how interesting that that really you know was for me because I um, converted to Catholicism um, 16 years ago. And um, I've learnt an awful lot um, about the church since then, because I think a lot of us grow up within the church and then really don't give it an awful lot of thought. Mm. And it's interesting what you were saying about the origins of the church and how it was handed down through the apostles and out into the world. And then you mention the um, Russian Orthodox Church. Um, I, I'm wondering whether you can explain a little bit more about the worldwide church, because of course we have the Catholic Church with the, the Pope at the head, and then the Anglican, and then we have the Eastern Orthodox. Um, in the town where I come from, in, in Keithley, we have a large number of the Kerala Indians who have now come across from there, and they um, celebrate a different rite, but that is also accepted as part of the church. I don't know if you could explain a little bit about that. Um, well... The church emerged on the foundation of the apostles. In uh, the first history of the church written by St. Luke called the Acts of the Apostles. And in the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, it said of the Christian community, they continued in the fellowship and teaching of the apostles in the breaking of bread and the prayers. That means that right early on the, the apostolic nature of the church uh, was firmly established on our Lord's foundation. Um, the sad thing is that human beings, what they are, can become uh, 
vying with one another. The Roman Catholic Church, as we have known it, emerged more strongly as such in the medieval period. Prior to that, in 1054, there was a great split between the, the Eastern Churches and the Western Churches. Then came the Reformation and uh, the Calvinistic background of Presbyterianism uh, emerged. Martin Luther attacked the, the erroneous teaching of the Middle Ages Roman Catholic Church. In Britain, uh, that nonsense of Henry VIII founding the Church of England is rubbish, absolute rubbish. I'm not an Anglican because of Henry VIII. I'm an Anglican because the Church in Britain was established long before even Augustine was sent to Britain. So you've got, you've got the, the great Eastern Orthodox churches, and I mentioned earlier, they were first called Christians at Antioch. And as I understand it, the church at Antioch, which is one of the Orthodox churches <coughs> today, uh, was quite firmly established even before such a term as the Roman Catholic Church emerged. For, don't forget, it was called the Church in Rome, the Church in Antioch, the Church in Jerusalem. And um, so we've got that, uh, that human failure where Christianity split. Uh, many of us are longing for the, that to break down. Uh, I won't see it in my lifetime. Um, but I hope it comes. Um, whilst I accept and respect the Christians of, of what are called the denominations. It's the apostolic line that is important because that's the foundation upon which Jesus built the church. Um, I don't know that I can tell you much uh, separately about the Russian Orthodox Church there all the Orthodox churches uh, developed kind of as a national church in a way uh, in their culture and locality uh, but there's a common faith a basic faith that underpins the Orthodox churches, the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican. Um, a number of the Protestant churches um, did not continue the apostolic line. Even was in Britain things had got in a bad way and in 1833 was what is known as the Catholic Revival when the Oxford movement came into being 
and woke the church up to its Catholic and apostolic heritage. John Wesley saw the dreadful chaos, pathos of the church and he broke the bounds of, of the diocesan scene and went through the country. But he pleaded with his followers not to leave the church and he remained a priest of the Church of England uh, till he died. Um, the, the term Methodist was brought into being by the followers of John Wesley because they, in those early days, they were methodical in their celebration of the Eucharist, in their daily prayers, in regular confession and in the administration of the other sacraments of the church. That's why they were called Methodists. They were methodical in following the teaching of the church. However, that's, uh, that's all part of the background. Um, I don't know whether that answers your question or not. But it does, it does very well indeed. Um, I, 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 I have more optimism about the, 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 the way in which the, the church has developed than, 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 than you have. I see it already as being in a form of unity. Mm. Um, I think somebody said, uh, somebody in the Catholic faith um, said, thank God for the Reformation. And I think that often out of what seems to be a, a disaster, um, then something fresh emerges. You know, we have these these places. Yes, I think Francis, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Bishop, um, you said that uh, the church started in the New Testament. But we we used to think that the Old Testament. The church started then in the Old Testament, but well, I've come to think now that the church starts in the New Testament. Well, what if we can Jesus really founded the church on the on the apostles, but the germ of the Christian faith emerged out of the Old Testament. Yes. But the Christian church, the church that Christ founded, only began with at the New Testament time. The um, I get very impatient with this term that's used these days, 2010 CE. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's AD, Anno Domini, in the year of the Incarnation. That's the correct way of um, describing the years in which we live. It goes back again and again to the Incarnation. Uh, why, did the, why did the East and the West split? I, I think I read something about it, but I've forgotten what, what it was. Um, the reason... Well, the, the, there, there were two things. One was um, the Bishop of Rome assuming central responsibility of the church on earth and the Orthodox churches said no that's not it that can't be and coupled with that uh, was the difference the Eastern Orthodox churches said that the Holy Spirit descended from the Father and in the West we've been inclined to believe that the Holy Spirit came from the Father 
through the sun. It's called the filioque clause and it's it's hassling with I think incidentals personally it's just nonsense. Um, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God yet there are not three gods but one God. I have a question Bishop um, I remember talking to a, a lady who was a um, very, very new Christian and she said that she always thinks of Jesus on the cross, bleeding on the cross. I said to her, it was my understanding certainly at the time and I still, a little bit so, I said, well, what we should think of is think of the cross as a symbol of Christ, but Christ is not on the cross now. No. And it says, and that's more important than thinking about Jesus on the cross. Think of where he was and what he did on the cross, and not the symbol of him on the cross. What do you say to that? Yeah, I, I'm a great believer in the crucifix, that is, Christ on the cross, but only because it was from the cross that he proclaimed the victory. And that's important. Yes, yeah. That I don't see... I don't dwell on the the bearing of sin on behalf of the world anything like I do that he chose the victory. Death is no more. It is finished. It's finished. That's hard to accept. And I hear a lot of nonsense said by even practicing Christians at the time of the death of their loved ones. But Christ has conquered death. It can not hold any, any power over us. But the victory was proclaimed from the cross for us. He battled with it, as I said earlier, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane when he had to accept or reject the Father's will. But it was from the cross that he proclaimed the victory. And then it, it was, as it were, verified by the resurrection, which was necessary for us to know. Um, I was intrigued when you explained about the cross which you have there, the, uh, the crucifix. What was the top? I can't remember. You started with the top symbol. Oh, the um, the dove representing yes. the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then the whole of it. It's lovely. Yeah. Yes, I've never seen this before. And um, the the company of heaven, mm. the the blessed mother, and of course the cross, yes. and the skull, which means that Christ conquered death. Yes. That's the symbolism of it. And I do like this business to remind us that it's not easy to live the Christian life mm. and, and that so many have suffered for it mm. right through the centuries, yes. whom we call the martyrs. Mm. <laughs> Bishop Stanley, um, a question has occupied my mind for quite some time and as to why why the, the, the spirit of the people, you know, has, it's not there any longer. And I, I have found that work by such writers as C.S. Lewis and Owen Barfield and now Prince Charles um, have, they've all contributed to make a very important point that with, with the rise of scientific rationalism um, men's thinking changed in the sense that uh, before that men were more conscious of the world around them but it was with the abstract thinking and uh, the objective as opposed to the, the subjective and it, it separated man in his mind and in this, um, one of the books I've read, it pointed out that ancient man saw with his eyes, but he didn't perceive with his mind the way modern man does. 
And it's a very important point. Oh, yes. And uh, you, in your explanation of that beautiful cross, you have brought in about the dove and also your mitre. And you, you pointed out the fish symbol, you pointed out the rose, and um, in Prince Charles's latest book, he goes back in history to show us that um, in the churches, in, uh, in astronomy, men saw these patterns they, within creation, and it is expressed in the churches. The buildings. In the buildings, they're not just uh, the Christian churches. And I think that there is a key there that it would be good for priests to look at, to understand why can't the young see it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's... The, it's partly a lack of sound teaching. Yeah. No question about that. My word. And uh, as you said in the car, there's too many sermons preached that's just social nonsense. Um, well, you didn't use that word, but I do. <laughs> I was being polite. <laughs> um, but coupled with that is the is is this whole economic thrust that it's economy is the thing and our politicians are as bad as ah and some of them are practicing christians they ought to know better than to put that nonsense over us uh, but and the young they're plagued aren't they with uh, with the endless television uh, programs and advertisements their fill their minds are filled with materialism how often do you see a decent program on the inner spiritual life I don't recall one I don't recall one um, I, I hope the tide turns. History has a, a way of repeating itself and turning. And perhaps that will happen. Hopefully it will. Um, I think there's a... I used to say... Uh, in Australia we haven't suffered for our faith like in other countries and until we do um, uh, we won't be purified in the fire uh, but um, I don't know this materialism is all over the world even in basic Christian countries not sure I don't know the answer to that um. I think, Bishop, thank you um, for these very useful insights and uh, just following your, your train of thought, um, I, I've written about rational economic man in, in many different ways and try to bring the humour in because it's so unlike real, real life. But I, I think I would be a little bit more optimistic than you're sounding at the moment. Good, good, um, pleased to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say that the church has a lot to answer for. Oh, my word. Yes. My word. Um, because the time when people really, you know, the, 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 they grow up within the materialistic world. Um, but it's when they have children that they begin to suddenly realise that there is something more. But of course there are pressures now to be both working full time in order to get the money coming yes. in. Yeah. Uh, and um, it, it, it is a case of re really um, looking for ways of reaching the young 
family, a very young family, um, because they're often in a period when the mother takes maternity leave, and as we were talking about the other day. And, um, and at that time, I think there are opportunities for like mother and toddler groups within the church which can introduce them. This is what we found happening within the Anglican Church, more than the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is extremely bad at, uh, at, at, at taking account of, of, of family life. You know, it, 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 you know, it's just we are the we we are the church, and you come to us. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I, I don't know if if within Australia you have this kind of mother and toddler provision, which uh, the, the, the what? Mother and toddler, where 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 the the mothers come with the baby, you know, when they've got young babies, and they can meet together within the church and perhaps have opportunity for prayers. We've found that this has been particularly successful in then bringing, um, bringing the young families into, uh, during the week, during the day, um, in, into an association with the church, and then they've often followed it up. Yeah. Um, I, you see, I lived my entire ministry, even as a bishop of a diocese, living amongst the people. It was almost unheard of for a bishop to go and actually visit the homes of the ordinary people. But I did it. Time and again, it used to... My registrar used to scream because he needed me in the office to sign documents or to do this or do that. But I was out there amongst... living with my priests and my people. Um, visiting, visiting, visiting right through my priesthood years but the priests are not doing it anymore mm. under the guise that you might be um, accused of molesting someone mm. <laughs> I realise that but but the priests are not doing it um, and that's part of the danger uh, that's before us, that therefore uh, young families don't know their priest. Um, I, <laughs> I used to love bringing the children around the altar and me sitting in a chair or on the step and talking to them. But I'll never, uh, there are some funny things, it's not relevant, but I remember one very hot morning at Yarrawonga where I was for 13 years and built a beautiful church there. And um, uh, we were in the old church before the new one was built. There were about a hundred people present at that particular mass and um, and uh, I was standing at the altar facing God, as I like to say, not the people. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and I had my Eucharistic vestments on, uh, but nothing much underneath. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, uh, all of a sudden there's a fiddling around at the back uh, of my robes, uh, which I didn't realise at the time. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the great e Eucharistic prayer and the consecration of the bread and wine, this little girl yelled out, Mum! Father hasn't got any pants on! <laughs> <laughs> and and I, might, I might tell you something. I was fairly new to the parish then and I was getting a real difficulty getting my teaching across to the people because I hadn't got to know them much. Uh, one of my valuable 
lessons in visiting people in their homes was to get the feeling of where they were in their spirit uh, journey of faith. Then I could feed it back into my teaching. Um, anyway, uh, so I, ha I hadn't really got to know them very well then, but um, but that particular morning changed the life of the parish because suddenly they could see there was something human, incarnational, about even the solemn Eucharist. Um, and uh, that little girl has now grown up to be a beautiful mother and a magnificent example of the Christian faith. <laughs> and she blushes every time I remind her about it. <laughs> Oh dear. Anyway, that was a bit of an aside, but um, I don't know how it's going to happen, but uh, I'm old-fashioned enough to realise that the priest has got to know his people, not just at the church door as they go after Mass. That's no good. You've got to You've got to know your people in their homes. And that's the way of building up the church and of strengthening their spiritual life and the lives of their children. But I hope the tide turns. <laughs>